show you is grooving. I'm feeling it cause it's gonna be. We're about to get it going. Our happiness is showing. We're rocking it cause it's gonna be. Great day. Great day in Houston. Great day. And now here's your host, Deborah Duncan. Welcome to Great Day Houston. Today's show deals with one of the most destructive things that can happen to individuals, their families, and our communities. Last year, almost 72,000 people died from an overdose. Thousands more are consumed with how to score their next dose, and oftentimes that means committing a crime to pay for it. So now you have that revolving door, stop using when you're in jail, go right back to it when you're released. What if the court system offered help instead of punishment for nonviolent offenders? That was an idea several years ago, and today there's proof that it worked. Spend $22,000 a year to keep someone in prison or just over $3,000 a year for rehab and a chance at life. When a person can become sober, what we get in return is something that's priceless. Three people on the front lines of this cause are Melissa Fitzgerald, the Director of Advancing Justice for NADCP, Judge Catherine Cabanis, and Mark Levin, who founded Right on Crime to encourage reform in the prison system. Good morning to all of you. Good morning, morning. Deborah. All right, let me just say this out front. If, if, uh, if she is looking familiar to you, it's because because you were an actress on the West Wing, I was. right? And so, yes. uh, so there you go, right there. Uh, you played Alice and Jenny's assistant, Carol. Okay, so let's get that out of the way. So while, while, while West Wing, you know, dealt with policy and politics and a whole bit, that's not so far removed from your real life. Yeah. And this whole cause we're talking about today is not so far removed because yeah. the law is in your family, isn't it? It is. My father um, actually just retired. Uh, he was a judge for many, many years, and he was a prosecutor in the district attorney his office prior to that and he launched a treatment court in Philadelphia many years ago so this has been in my blood yeah. because you know I, I'm very fortunate now I get to work at National Association of Drug Court Professionals where we ensure that people who come into contact with the criminal justice system who have an addiction issue substance use disorder mental health condition trauma they can receive treatment through a court program instead of incarceration yeah. and Catherine I met you when you were the head of Crime Stoppers Houston that's right uh, but now you're behind the bench but even with Crime Stoppers you saw how many different crimes and things that would be committed by somebody who was an addict to support their habit but it was again that revolving door again and again and again so that's now as right. a judge you have a chance to change things that's right on the bench certainly a way to to try to help from a different perspective uh, when I was at Crime Stoppers of course we were sending the cases to the courthouse now we're handling them uh, handling them from the bench and uh, trying to through the drug court really focus on rehabilitation rather than incarceration. Yeah, and Mark, over the years, I mean, that's what we, we kind of battle with. You know, uh, there are people who have a mindset of just lock people away and keep them away. Uh, we cannot lock up that many people. So <laughs> we also had to look at, are we, just to punish somebody's one thing, but what if we could save somebody? And so this was an idea that came about for all kinds of reasons, even economic reasons. Yeah, no, it's exactly right. And in Texas, we've made a good deal of progress. We've closed eight prisons, uh, but there's a lot more to do. We still have the sixth highest incarceration rate in the nation um, and of course this country has 25 percent of the world's prisoners and five percent of the world's population wow. so uh, what we really ought to focus on is for example we still have 17,000 people in Texas prisons for drug possession uh, and then as you alluded to many people commit property crimes stealing to feed their drug habit and drug courts are one of the ways that's proven yeah. dozens of studies to reduce recidivism keep families together and save those tax dollars yeah and let me move to keep families together I, I you know every child I think really wants their mom and dad yeah. no matter what the situation is and so when we when we separate them oftentimes we perpetuate that cycle no question and I, I know that we'll have some guests on to talk mm -hmm. a little bit more about that later but that's one of the really beautiful things about treatment courts is that we give an opportunity for the parent, for the child, for the family member, the loved one to get treatment and to get their lives back and return home to be parents and neighbors and contributing members of our communities where we greatly need what they have to give. Yeah, right. Judge Kavanagh, I have um, a couple of friends in college who found themselves in trouble mm -hmm. and the last place they would want to be is in front of a judge. That's right. <laughs> but I've had people who've gone through drug treatment courts and they were shocked and surprised at how comforting it was to be in front of 
a judge like you? Well, certainly the treatment courts, the drug courts, have a different perspective. Uh, the uh, potential is, the role is to try to rehabilitate uh, rather than incarcerate. And so there are uh, many staff members and many agencies that are working together to try to rehabilitate people, make them productive citizens, tax-paying citizens, working citizens, back together with their families. Um, we really find that the drug courts transform lives. Yeah. They take those those repeat offenders and make them into productive citizens. And Mark, let me make sure that people understand. Um, this is for nonviolent offenders, correct? Yes, that's the case. And um, these are people that, again, they've had a drug possession issue because of their addiction. They have perhaps committed, you know, shoplifting or something to get uh, funds to buy drugs. Um, and so, if you solve that habit, and that's what it's not just a courtroom. The drug courts depend on treatment programs mm -hmm. and they're also often a probation officer so there's a whole team around that individual and they work closely with their family a spouse for example who can be a source of support a minister people that can come around that individual uh, as part of the drug court intervention and uh, again in the traditional justice system a judge just passes off the case pass someone send yeah. someone to prison and I think that and we have kind of a, in our mindset that you kind yeah. of go okay you did what now let's see yeah. that means it's punishable by I'm gonna give you somewhere in the middle and, and go yeah. away. And, what, and what's interesting is I think you can speak to this better than I can is that treatment is a critical piece of it. It's called yeah. a treatment court for a reason, and it's not a judge making a random decision. There's a yeah. team that Judge Kevin is yeah. talking about. Make your decisions. And, and I think I think that that is really what it goes to the point that you were making earlier as well. You know, it's it's about the treatment and the team, and that there are consequences for actions, but the goal is always rehabilitation yeah. rather than incarceration. So that old traditional lock them up and throw away the key really isn't the focus anymore. Now it's about how can we help this person rehabilitate and become so sober and productive and every member of the treatment team is really engaged in that. It's all for the benefit of that person transforming them but for the greater good as well, for the benefit of everyone, decreasing crime in the community one person at a time. Yeah, I remember I was actually in a drug court watching uh, some proceedings at one point, and um, the, the guy standing up there had actually been to rehab a few times. Right. And so what you find in this court as well is that you're a little more forgiving, because a lot of people would say, well, you've already been. We know that rehab doesn't work that way, you know? Well, right. we know that we're willing to give someone another chance and to put them on probation. We're forgiving to that extent, uh, but it's also about treatment and maintaining that sobriety and that there are consequences if there are um, for failures. We want the success, and so it's always with the focus on success, yeah. uh, though it's not uh, its not easy. Well, having consequences is one of those things that is going to make that person a partner in their own recovery. Right. And I want to point out the research basically says it's the swiftness and sureness of the consequence. So going to jail for the weekend, keep your job, stay yeah. with your family, but if you, you know, if you don't show up for drug court, for example, yeah, yeah, someone will make sure you go to jail for that weekend, and you'll realize, i got to go to the drug court. Yeah, so or it could be the, this is the sentence you were looking for. <laughs> At. Yeah. <laughs> this is five years in prison, right? If you want to avoid this, let's let's work a little harder at this it's, if we can. It's and a it, little different than the traditional rehab. Right. Yeah, and it, it's sanctions right. and rewards because right. that's the other thing that I think is important to remember is that these courtrooms are strict accountability. They yeah. are pla still places, and this is public health and public safety being married together. Right. And public safety is still critically important. So that's that's right. the primary thing. But these places, being places of strict accountability, are also places of hope and healing yeah. and an understanding where the judge has been trained in these areas. I was going to say, a, a way to make it to make it make sense, I, I have a couple friends who are victims of crime mm -hmm. and they have no forgiveness. And right. when you were a victim, you're in a different space, right? Uh, but being somebody who was the head of a Crime Stoppers at one time, you look at it and say, but this is what can make sense in so many different ways. We mentioned right. financially earlier, yeah. the yeah. money, it makes sense. That's right, it makes sense for so many different reasons. Before I was at Crime Stoppers, I was actually a prosecutor, mm -hmm. and I worked as a prosecutor in the drug court, so I was one of those uh, participants. And I recognized back at that time that it's about fighting crime, it's about being tough on crime, but in a smart way. Right. And that's what we're doing now. Uh, from the bench as the judge, it's fighting crime, tough but smart. Yeah. Well, we have to lock up the people we're afraid of, not those we're mad at. And with the, yeah. you, graduate right. from the, yep. you graduate from the drug court, you get a graduation certificate, and some of these people never graduated from 
from anything, and they potentially get it off their record too, so they can get a job, get an apartment. Yeah, we'll talk about how, yeah. how to get a job after you've had a record. We just saw some pictures there earlier, and you see those smiling faces, yeah. and, and mm -hmm. these are people who now have a fighting chance. Mm -hmm. All right, coming up, when an addict is in court for committing a crime, they might expect the heavy hand of the law, as you just heard. Instead, our next guest got a helping hand from the legal system, and she says after four near-death experiences, that help is what finally saved her life. We'll hear from her next.